In the past few segments, we talked about elimination reactions, and we talked about the E1 reaction mechanism where a carbocation formed and then a proton was removed at the beta position in order to give an alkene product. We talked about the E2 reaction mechanism where the base came in and grabbed a proton from the beta position at the same time the leaving group left in order to create an alkene reaction product. So that would be our elimination product, for example, for this reaction that we've shown here. And the reactants that go into the elimination reactant reactions that we talked about were very similar to the reactants that went into the substitution reactions that we've looked at previously, where you started with a molecule that was bonded to a good leaving group, such as a halogen, reacted with a molecule that had a lone pair of electrons, right here, where that molecule, Y, with the lone pair of electrons, could typically act as either a base, meaning it grabs a proton, or it could act as a nucleophile, meaning it's going to form a bond to a carbon atom, to give the substitution product. In the case of Y acting as a nucleophile, to form a bond to the carbon atom, you get this substitution product. Or if Y acts as a base, you instead get the elimination product. So these two reactions, the two pathways to go towards substitution using an SN1 or an SN2 route, and elimination using an E1 or E2 route are in constant competition with one another. Under typical circumstances, the substitution reaction usually wins and usually dominates. What situations will result in favoring the elimination pathway to give an alkene over the substitution pathway. That's what we're going to talk about in this segment is we're going to go through some of the criteria that will lead to tweaking the reaction toward favoring prevalence of the elimination product over the substitution product. So let's go through those guidelines. So these are the criteria we can look at to help us predict whether elimination will be favored over substitution. So in general, the criteria that we're going to look at to favor elimination over substitution will be as follows. Looking through this list of criteria about when we're gonna favor elimination reactions to give alkenes over substitution reactions, the first thing that we can look at on our list is that elimination reactions are gonna become more favorable the stronger the base is in the reaction. So the stronger the base, the more likely we are to get elimination. That should be no surprise because remember that elimination requires a base to grab that proton at the beta position. So the stronger the base, the more eager that is going to be to react at the beta position. So if we use a stronger base, particularly a really strong base, in other words, a really unstable base, stronger bases are gonna to tend to start preferring elimination reactions over substitution. That's not to say that you can't use a relatively strong base in a substitution reaction, but it's to say that the stronger the base, generally we're gonna start having a stronger preference toward elimination. And there is definitely always a competition between elimination and substitution. We're not making absolute statements here. We're saying, what can we do to kind of steer the reaction toward elimination rather than substitution? The second thing we can look at is that if the base is quite bulky, it's very often going to be poorly able to act as a nucleophile and instead it will favor grabbing a beta proton to give elimination. So second criteria for favoring elimination over substitution is that bulky bases are going to prefer elimination. So for example, something like potassium tert butoxide. So let's try to draw out the structure of potassium tert butoxide. So potassium, of course, just K plus. Oxide refers to the oxygen atom, and tert but is referring to a tert butyl group. So it's a tert butyl group bonded to an oxygen atom. So O bonded to a tert butyl group, and that O is going to be an anion, since it has to counter the positively charged potassium. So this would constitute a bulky base because attached to that basic atom we have that bulky tert butyl group and what's going to be the case is that this bulky 
base is going to have a very hard time accessing the carbon that's bonded to the leaving group because it's so bulky it's just going to have a sterically difficult time getting in to attack that carbon atom in a substitution reaction. So instead what's going to be more favorable is for it to attack a proton because those protons are situated more on the outside surface of the organic molecule. And so they can more easily be accessed by this bulky base. And so that's going to make bulky bases prefer elimination over substitution because the bulky base can more easily get access to the proton than it can to the carbon that's bonded to the leaving group. So bulky bases have easier access to the protons, particularly those beta protons, than the carbon atom that's bonded to the leaving group. And so that's going to help favor the elimination reaction over the substitution reaction. Furthermore, if we couple items one and two together, if we use a strong base that is also bulky, that's going to make the situation even more favorable. So an example of that would be if we had, say, a nitrogen atom that's directly bonded to two relatively bulky groups here, and that were a nitrogen anion countered with sodium as the cation, that's another example of a bulky base. And in fact, that nitrogen anion in the base is gonna make it even more basic than having an oxygen anion because nitrogen is less electronegative than oxygen and therefore nitrogen is less stable as an anion, hence a stronger base. So that's gonna make this nitrogen anion really fit criteria one and two really well to help favor eliminations. Not only bulky, it is also a very strong base. The third thing on the list of criteria is that just as a bulky base will result in a preference for elimination reactions, if we have a lot of steric hindrance around the alpha carbon, that's going to cause an increase for the preference in elimination as well, because the hindrance around the alpha carbon is gonna make it difficult for a nucleophile to get in and attack that carbon, and therefore that nucleophile will instead have a stronger preference to grab one of those protons at the beta position because those are more accessible. They are less sterically hindered, in other words. So the third criteria on when elimination becomes favorable over substitution is when steric hindrance at the alpha carbon is high. And remember that the term alpha carbon may be throwing you off a little bit here. The term alpha carbon, we're referring to the carbon that's bonded to the leaving group. In other words, that in the E1 reaction mechanism of the carbon that becomes the carbocation. So if there's a lot of steric hindrance around that alpha carbon, that's going to cause a greater preference for elimination to occur. So if we can craft these three criteria so that they are all in favor of elimination, that's where we're going to start to really push the pendulum between elimination and substitution toward the side of elimination. If we say have a strong base that is also bulky and the molecule that it's reacting with has a lot of steric hindrance at the carbon that's bonded to the leaving group, that's going to help favor the elimination reaction. So let's do an example of a competition between elimination and substitution and try to look at what's going to be more favorable there most likely. All right, so we'll take a look at this problem. And as usual, I fully encourage you to hit the pause button at some point and try to think about this on your own and struggle through it and then look at the solution to see how you did. So we're gonna propose the major organic product of the following reaction and explain why we propose that as the major product. And you're given the clue here that it's either an E1 or an SN1 reaction, but we need to decide what we would expect to be the major pathway here. In order to accomplish that, we're going to think about those criteria that we just went over for deducing whether an elimination pathway or a substitution pathway is more favorable. So to think about whether this would be E1 or SN1 as the preferred route, we need to keep in mind the items we mentioned up top. So first off, we can ask ourselves, are we using a strong base? So the base here is water. Water is of course a relatively stable molecule. There's no formal charges. And so we would definitely describe this as being weakly basic conditions. 
Okay, so that's one strike against elimination and one vote in favor of substitution is that we're using a weak base. How about the steric hindrance of the base? Is the base a bulky base? I would say the answer is no. H2O is about as non-bulky as we can get. So a non-bulky base is also going to favor nucleophilic substitution over elimination. So that's a second vote in favor of substitution over elimination. And then the third criteria we looked at was increasing the steric hindrance around the carbon that's bonded to the leaving group will cause an increase in the preference for elimination. If we look at the carbon that's bonded to the leaving group right here, that's not a particularly sterically hindered carbon atom as far as tertiary carbons go. It's just bonded to an ethyl group and two methyl groups. And so I would say that it's a relatively non-hindered tertiary carbon. Remember that tertiary carbons are definitely inevitably more sterically hindered than a secondary carbon or a primary carbon. But amongst comparing apples to apples with tertiary carbons to other tertiary carbons, I would say this is not a very sterically hindered tertiary carbon that we are looking at right here. So we're not going to have a very sterically hindered tertiary carbocation in the SN1 or the E1 mechanism. And so that's going to also favor substitution to have a non-sterically hindered carbocation intermediate coming into this. So all signs point to substitution being the favored route here. And so we're asked here just to predict the major organic product of the substitution reaction was what we deemed to be the favored reaction here and explain why. So our why do substitution, we can answer using these three criteria as our explanation of why. And to propose the major product, we're not asked to give a mechanism, we're just asked to give the major product. So in predicting the major product, I always ask myself what the carbocation intermediate is going to be to make sure that I'm not making a stupid mistake about not doing a rearrangement when a rearrangement is needed. So our carbocation here, intermediate would be this, that is a tertiary carbocation, so therefore there's no need to do a rearrangement. Instead, the nucleophile can attack that straight away. So the H2O would come in and attack that carbocation to form a carbon bond to the water. Then the water H2O loses the proton to give a hydroxy group there. So our final product here looks just like this as our final major predicted organic product. The prediction here being that it's an SN1 reaction for those reasons that we listed in red below. Let's now do one additional example to finish up here and make sure that we have the full hang of how to go about determining whether elimination or substitution are going to win. So we'll take a look at this example problem. As usual, I recommend you hit the pause button, try to do this on your own, then hit play to see the result. We're predicting the major product of the competition that occurs between E2 and SN2 reactions here. So looking at this problem and going through the rationale for favoring E2 or SN2, we're gonna look first at the structure of the base. And we're gonna ask ourselves, is this a relatively sterically hindered base or a not so sterically hindered base? I would definitely say that in this case, we are dealing with a sterically hindered base because our oxygen atom here directly bonded to a carbon, that's a tertiary carbon that's directly bonded to two ethyl groups there as well as a methyl group. So we have a lot of bulks that that oxygen atom is carrying along behind it there. So I would certainly describe this as being a bulky base relative to having something like sodium methoxide or sodium hydroxide. So that bulkiness of the base is going to favor our elimination reaction. We can also ask about the strength of the base, certainly relative to using an alcohol or water here as our base. This is definitely much stronger because this has a negative charge on the oxygen, whereas water or an alcohol-based base do not have a formal charge. So it is a relatively strong base. The stronger the base, the stronger the preference for E2. So this is gonna also sort of tip the pendulum toward E2. 
And then the third thing we can look at is the steric hindrance around the alpha carbon atom. So looking at the alpha carbon, that's our carbon right here, or in other words, the carbon has a leaving group bonded to it. And I would say that is pretty sterically hindered because it's got a tert butyl group directly bonded to it, as well as these two groups over here, the two additional tert butyl groups a little bit further away. So I would say that we're definitely dealing with a situation where there's a lot of bulk around that carbon that's bonded to the leaving group. So in other words, the alpha carbon has a lot of steric hindrance. So alpha carbon steric hindrance or atomic crowding in other words is high and that's also going to favor the elimination reaction over the substitution reaction. So therefore, we should be going the elimination route here. All three factors are pointing us in favor of the elimination reaction. So we take a look at our reactants here and keep in mind that our oxygen is gonna act as a base. In fact, our oxygen atom has so much bulk associated with it that when I write out my mechanism here to help me get to the product, I'm just gonna put R there as an abbreviated way of showing the bulk that's associated with that oxygen atom so that I don't have to draw that out every time. Oxygen comes in, it is going to grab a proton from the beta position. The beta position would be here. There's no protons directly bonded there because of the three methyl groups. Or here's the other beta position. And we do have a proton there that's up for grabs. So that's where we're gonna form the bond. So the oxygen will use its lone pair of electrons right here to come in, grab a proton at that beta position. Carbon hydrogen bond breaks and the electrons come over to make a carbon carbon double bond. At the same time, the iodine leaves as our leaving group. Iodine is a really capable leaving group because it has a really large atomic radius. So once it breaks away, you'd get I minus, which is very stable, even relative to the other anions of halogens because of the fact that iodine has a much bigger atomic radius than those other possibilities. And then getting back to our organic product here, I'm gonna draw out all of these features of our pretty gigantic organic molecule here. Leaving group has left, and in its place now between those two carbon atoms, we should put in our carbon-carbon double bond. It goes right here as our final organic product, our major organic product of this reaction. So we're going to draw a square around that to represent that as our major organic product here. And that's what we're usually referring to when we're talking about the major product of reactions in organic chemistry is we're usually interested in what the organic product of those is. So with that, hopefully you are much more comfortable now at thinking about whether a reaction is likely to follow an elimination pathway or a substitution pathway by looking at criteria related to the bulkiness of the base, the strength of the base, and the steric hindrance around the alpha carbon. And if we see that all three of those factors are going in favor of one type of reaction pathway or another, we can predict that the major product will be steered in that direction. If there is some conflict amongst those different criteria where some of them point toward elimination and others point toward substitution, then you're likely to get a more equal split between the substitution product and the elimination product. And generally in those sorts of cases, you'll be given some additional information embedded in the problem, such as show the elimination product or show the substitution product to guide you toward what is expected of the product that you are showing. So with that, we conclude our discussion of elimination reactions where we have halogens as our leaving group. In the next segment, what we're going to look at is a related type of reaction referred to as a dehydration reaction where the leaving group is going to be water. We will start with an alcohol. We will plug an extra proton onto the OH group of the alcohol to give water. Water will then break away and we'll get elimination reactions going on there. So stay tuned for that.